Everyone out there, we'll get started in just a minute or two. Hey, Tony. Good morning. Hey there. Oh, good day. How are you? Good. It's, uh, it's raining here. It's been hot, 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 and it's, it's raining, but it just stopped. So uh, it's, a, it's a sunny sun, summer afternoon here. How about in uh, Wellington, New Zealand? Wellington, it's, uh, it's overcast and windy with uh, a wind from the northwest. Uh, but for June, it's pretty good, I suppose. Yeah. Should we wait another minute or so before we get started, you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. We let a few more people in. Okay. And uh, see how we go. All right. Cool. Do you want to tell me about these guitars you've got in the background? I don't know if you can see them. Uh, well, I've got my guitar that you built for me back in 2011, my Tony Francis Style 1 which is my main guitar these days. And I also have this style one that I got in, I think, 1988 at Groons from Groons Guitar on a mail order. And, uh, you know, so those are my two, my two Weisenheimers. It's beautiful. I see the sunrise on the old one is on a tilt slightly. Is that intentional? No, I don't know. I think it's just the way it is for the moment, but yeah. I've had that same pickup in there for you know ever since. And so far so good. So uh, Tony answers, how's the weather like a really good fisherman? Well, <laughs> I hope that's the case. Yeah, well, we do our best. Good morning. All right, should we go ahead? Yeah, I think should we good. go ahead and kick off here. Yeah. All right. So Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Rob Vanderlick. I'm a uh, Chicago-based musician and wise and born aficionado. I host a blog called the Square Neck Journal and also a Facebook discussion group by the same name. And we're here with Tony Francis, uh, who I consider to be a, an authority and a builder of wise and born style Hawaiian guitars based out of Wellington, New Zealand. And it's eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, Tony's time, so he's probably having his first cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, so my first encounter of, of uh, playing one of Tony's guitars was uh, I was teaching at the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago, and this guy came to class and he had this Weisenborn style guitar that I'd never seen before. And I was like, oh, that looks really nice. Do you mind if I play that? And his name is Boris Barbish, and who I think Tony will remember. And I played this guitar and I said, wow, that's really nice guitar. That got me interested in Tony's guitars. I had never heard of them before. Um, I started doing a little checking on the interwebs, eventually ordered a guitar, I got my guitar in 2011. And that's been my main Weisenborn guitar ever since. Um, and most of what, just to cue us up here, I'm gonna kind of give you some background. I wanna ask Tony a few questions, then we'll open it up for some Q and A. So I didn't really completely understand the depth of Tony's uh, commitment and interest in building a faithful replica of Hawaiian uh, Weisenborn style guitars. You know, at that time, I just knew it was a really great guitar. Later on, when Tony uh, put his blog up and I started looking at some of the restorations that he had done and then started talking with Tony on a sort of, you know, on, on and off basis, I started to realize the depth of his interest and you know the, the, the work that he had put into learning about these guitars and how that had influenced his own building and that's part of what you know partly what i want to talk about today uh, most of what i know about Weisenborn guitars comes from having a vintage guitar myself um, from playing a bunch of bunch of vintage guitars over the years and certainly from playing a bunch of contemporary guitars before i forget and also by reading this book, which is, you know, in case you're not familiar with it, is, you know, the Bible for Weisenborn guitar written by Tom Noe and Dan Bost. And has, you know, it, it basically tells 
the story of uh, Herman Weisenborn, Chris Knudsen's influence on him and so forth. So that's what I know about these guitars. And what interests me about trying to get Tony on a live stream today is that not only has Tony read the book, he's done a lot of uh, restorations on vintage guitars and built his own guitar. So, I mean, there's a lot of questions that I have. And so just to open, I wanna just pose just a couple of questions and then, you know, I might have more later on, but I guess the first question that I would like to ask you, Tony, is so I'm guessing you know, most of the folks here, if we think about our first experience playing Weisenborn guitar, we probably remember where we were, you know, who we heard and how we felt about Weisenborn guitar at that first experience. So what was your first experience like and how did you get started restoring Bitch's guitars and building your own guitars? Okay, uh, thanks. Um, sorry, is the question, uh, what's my first experience playing or first experience hearing the guitar? Well, say, say first experience hearing and then what, what, you know, what finally got made you make the decision that like, I think I want to start restoring and building my own guitars. Too. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, my brother came home from university with a Ben Harper record. And I remember running home from school to listen to the Ben Harper record. I was like, quite, I remember hearing the sound and just being uh, completely obsessed by it. But and, and reading the liner notes, like that was the days of CDs and you'd sort of read the liner notes and it said uh, Ben Harper vocals, guitar, Weizenborn, and I'm sort of like, what's a Weizenborn, right. you know? Um, but I, I, later, I later found out that, um, you know, Weizenborn was all over the Jackson Brown records and stuff that mum and dad listened to when we were kids growing up. So Weizenborn was sort of through my childhood, but without me really being aware of it. Yeah. Sure. And... When did that transition to building? Uh, there's sort of a, a couple of things at play there. Um, I wanted to, I think when I figured out what the instrument was, I wanted to get one. And this is sort of the early days of the internet, early days of eBay. And right. why is among guitars that weren't really readily available? Maybe you could get an old one uh, on eBay or something, but it would be in bad condition. Um, and I I got the first sort of introduction to the instrument I had was through a local uh, guitar maker here in Wellington who was sort of building reproductions and I, I bought one off him and I used to go and uh, see him every month and pay for the guitar and uh, and as, yeah it sort of all came together at once he was um, building and so I at the time had a chef job and um, I used to go from my job being screamed at in the kitchen to the sort of tranquil workshop setting and um yeah it just uh it all just started to fit together yeah. so i guess one one thing that i've always wondered is do you think you could build a great uh contemporary hawaiian style guitar without having done all the work on the restorations and having your hands on an actual vintage guitar no no I think there's a lot going on with those old guitars and I think my career has been a great example of that. that I mean I've been beating on my craft in the same design for 16 years and I still only feel like I'm just getting good at it you know like the, uh, the Weizenborn guitars are very simply made uh, and in that simplicity like a lot of great design is a lot of detail it's, it's really hard to produce something simply so no. I don't think without studying those, you could produce something great. Although I, I guess there are examples of, of other makers building in a modern style, but I don't know. They, I think the players seem to gravitate towards the old ones for a particular reason. Um, yeah. So were there any surprises when you started taking apart the, you know, the vintage guitars, like surprises when you, you know, took them apart and were looking at how the work was done and, and, and things along those along those lines. Surprises. Not really. They're very simply made. Uh, I think the vintage Wasmans. When I started building guitars, there was no one else producing a reproduction as such. You know, like a high glue coal wood reproduction. People were doing their own take, and uh, right. and they were sort of quite bagged on as far as um 
you know, like they have rough sawn braces and saw marks and such on the inside. Right. So it's sort of um, quite heavily critiqued. Okay. So what did, you know, was, was Herman Weisenborn a genius or did he just get lucky? You know, genius. I don't think, I don't think you can accidentally stumble upon greatness. I, I really don't. And uh, I mean, you, you've played a lot of these, you know, like this, they're all consistently good. Some are better than others, but they're all consistently good. And I feel like that um, that's a lot more than you can say for most of the modern guitars, you know, like just the sheer musicality of them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So how important is the hollow neck? I mean, as I understand it, Knudsen patented, patented, you know, the acoustic chamber and he had his version of a, you know, a Hawaiian guitar. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Shearson was making a version of a Hawaiian guitar. There was a Hawaiian guitar craze, especially in the late teens, early 1920s. How important was that hollow neck to the sound of, of the Hawaiian, of, the, of a Weisenborn guitar? Because you built the solid neck for, for George, for Tom Noe. So yeah. I'm just wondering, like, how, how important is it? Yeah, it, 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 it creates the distinctive sound. So I, I think of the sound as being a tool that musicians want. And I did, the, the first solid neck I did was with uh, George No, and it was incredibly aggressive. Like the, the sheer amount of reflection off the neck um, made the guitar incredibly aggressive and uh, sharp to, to the ear. And I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Kona design, which is similar to a solid neck in, a, in as much as it has the wooden neck, but it has the deeper body. And, uh, and they just sound more guitar-like. They don't really sound like a Weizenborn at all, whatever that oh, is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I think, well, I think one question probably on the minds of, of, you know, of the folks here is, you know, the original Weizenborns were offered in four different styles, yeah. different price points. You know, plain, not a lot of, uh, you know, like this is a style one, you know, you got three rings around, concentric rings around the sound hole. Yeah. Um, you have the rope binding, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite plain. But talk about the different models and, you know, were, is it all cosmetic or were there any differences in the sound of the guitar? What do you think? Like, what's your, what's your experience? I, 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 to me, it, yeah, to me, it's like, if you get a, if I use an analogy, if you buy a Martin, you know, D28 versus a D45, you're really paying, you know, it, the wood may look fancier, but in general, you're paying for the fancy look. I don't know if that's going to sound any different. Yeah, 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 I think, I think that's right. I, I feel like there might be a mahogany rosewood difference there. I'm not really an expert in round neck guitars. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I believe that there is no distinction between the style one and the style four or any of the others in the mix. I, I think what you've got here is a progression in wood grading. And I am familiar with this through buying the raw timber and gluing it together and, and uh, shaping it. And one of the things you do as a luthier is you are flex testing. And so what I've become sort of aware of is that the fancier wood, the curl, it's called flamed or curly core, it, um, it's inherently stiffer. And so I think the, the sound difference that people are hearing is more like a, a reflection of the stiffness of the wood. And oh. I think Weizenborn was aware of this because if you measure the thickness of the old Weizenborn guitars, they're graduated like a, a loudspeaker. So in the in the center, they're thicker, and then they're thinned towards the edge. Um, and that controls the amount of flex that you have at the top. Um, and so on a good day, you can control that sound so that the style one or style four sound consistent with the same amount of flex. And okay. on a less good day, maybe maybe not so much. But yeah, you have a lot of control in the building process with bracing and uh, the stiffness of the braces that you choose, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, no. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't believe that the style ones will force, but I, I. I purely think it's about wood, and you get that as well with some style fours have got quite plain color, and and others are incredibly curly. Yeah. Right. 
Right. Um, so if I understand this correctly, the, you know, the first Herman Weisenborn, you know, built his first Weisenborn, I think around 1916, 1917, and they were built until I think 37. Yeah. But there were sort of different eras of production. I think he moved into his factory. I want to say it was in 22 or 23. But if you think about like the, of the Weisenborn, the vintage guitars that you've seen, you know, talk about the different eras of production and were there changes that he made in the design of the guitar over year, over the, over the period of time that he made almost you know, 20, 21 years. Mm-hmm. Were there changes in the design, and, and you know, how do you think of those different eras, like the early era, where he's there's there's a picture of Herman in the guitar, you yeah, know, the, uh, then he's got the brand, and then I think around twenty seven or so, they started building them, trying to make them heavier to to produce more volume, and then I think that I think those are the eras. But talk about that from a from what you've seen from uh, doing restoration work, and you know. How that affected your own uh, decisions as a builder when you started offering your own guitars? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this this book I came across this quite early in my career, and um, George, no, if you're watching, thank you for this book. It's still the it's still the best. It's still the best. Um, I know that he's done a lot of work since he pro- this was produced. I don't know, maybe in the late '90s or something, and so it's sort of a bit outdated, but mostly still true to today. But I was, because of this book, I was always aware that there was a progression. And so when I um, sort of was looking at reproducing them, I, I sort of knew what I wanted. I knew, I knew what my favorite musicians were touring with. And I knew that that was around the sort of late 20s era stuff. Um, but it's funny, that, that thing you were talking about before, about the style ones and style fours sounding different the construction as they go along you know the top thickness changes you can sort of we look at the the bridge length or design to sort of indicate what era it was made or maybe the finish but associated to that as a as a different bracing design a bracing thickness and a top thickness and so within each sort of era you can roughly group the construction features and uh sorry i forget the question um Well, uh, you know, I was just wondering, you know, from your perspective, like the different eras, you know, do you think of, like I've heard Tom Noe say that he thought that the era from say 22 to 26, he calls the golden era, but yeah. he said, he also says, but they all sound good. So I'm just wondering how you think of that. Yeah, I, for my personal taste, I really like the ones from the late 20s and early 30s. My favorite guitar by was and born is the teardrop, which is sort of, late 20s through early 30s. I think when you get to the mid 30s or yeah, mid and late 30s, they can be pretty pretty crude. I'm not even entirely sure that all of those later ones were finished by Weisenborn and if potentially after his death, the um, what was left of the factory was finished by someone else because there's sort of a bit of inconsistency there. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, George or Tom know, he, he knows what he's talking about. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't question what he's saying. It, um, it, I think the sound is just a personal aesthetic on. Sure. On, yeah. Um, I, I struggle with the early ones a little bit. I think they're quite fragile. I, I certainly most of the ones that come in here for repair are around that era. Um, yeah. And yeah, the, the, the glue joints seem to be, you know, not in great condition and top um, deformation is a real problem for the earlier ones but as you say yep. there was that progression in design to sort of help um, sort that out you know it started with the solid necks and um, the very early thin body guitars is the pancake and uh and and that progressed on to the sort sure. of early production ones like you've got in the background here right and yeah and then so it's the small small bridge ones that i love Okay, so I have two two more questions, and then I think we'll open up for Q and A. So one question is, uh, one of the best sounding Weisenborns I ever played was I'd forgotten if it was a style one. I think it was a style one, but I played it at Groon's Guitars in Nashville, and the under the under the bridge, the 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 bridge was it was bowed up on this side, and it was concave or or you know like that, and you could see that the bridge was coming up. 
Yep. And it looked like it was about to explode. And it was, when I played it, I was just amazed at how good it sounded. And it got me thinking, because I'm not a builder, it got me thinking about how important the bracing is to these, these guitars. And I've played uh, some contemporary style guitars, which looked amazing. Yes. But when I played it, it just didn't have the responsiveness. It didn't have that shimmer, that ring that a great Weisenborn guitar has. I mean, that to me, that's like the hallmark of a great Weisenborn guitar when you play it. You just, yeah. It's captivating, you know, the way that it shimmers and the way that it, it sustains and it rings in its own unique way. So talk about the bracing of these things. It seems like Herman Weisenborn got it just right, yeah. where they were braced just enough, but not too much. And I've seen a few that certainly looked like they were you know, sort of had some da structural damage because the bracing wasn't, I'm just, this is my own take, not super strong, but that was sort of the main thing that made it sound good at the same time. I'm just wondering how that looks from your perspective. Oh, oh absolutely. I've had a few original ones that have been pretty deformed and they sounded amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a real thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know how people feel about that from two perspectives one owning owning an old guitar and having it kind of deformed but sounding amazing and whether that bothers people um i certainly know that from a modern production perspective that that's not acceptable um and so it really it puts a challenge on builders to be able to produce something that's geometrically correct but also sound incredible um the wasm ones they're built somewhat differently to a modern guitar they are uh, they're arched using humidity which is essentially the top is flat uh, and then they're built in the dry environment and when you add the bracing with high glue the amount of moisture it adds it sort of springs the top and uh and so that construction method is somewhat sort of crude by modern standards which is arched using a domed dish or whatever um, and so that's why when you look down the top, it sort of deforms quite badly. It's because it doesn't have that huh. inherent strength to begin with. Um, yeah. But I, I absolutely believe that's a critical part of the sound. Cool. So uh, my last question, and then we'll open it up for Q and A, is uh, uh, there's another uh, a resin resophonic guitar builder, Tim Shearhorn, mentioned to me one time. Yes. You know, we were talking about guitars, and he said, "Well, it's one thing." That and look at the outside fit. That's what everybody looks at with guitars. You know, ooh, ah, uh, look at the wood. It looks amazing. And, and certainly that's the, that's, that's one aspect of guitars. But he said, when it comes to playability and the sound, what's inside is what really matters. Does that, does that ring true to you as a builder as well? Yeah, of course. Of course. It's, I don't know. Like, it, I believe it's about um, doing things right, even when people can't see. And, and I think that might be a hard thing to grasp for a lot of people, but, you know, um, I think people, when they buy a guitar, whether it be old or new, they're sort of, they're looking at a finished product that they purchase. But from a, from a manufacturing perspective, you know, it's like, we've got a certain amount of hours to produce this item, but, but really it's like, you, when you bend the, the sides, are they bent beautifully and do they fit the mold perfectly or do they have tension in them, you know? And, these sort of things, they, I feel like they, they show up later. So I, I feel like Weisenborn had this as well, where you're, you're trying to do things right. You're trying to make things so that they fit properly so that that tension doesn't then translate through the rest of the guitar. Yeah. Right. But some Beautiful. people, right. yeah, I don't know. Pe people really criticize the, um, the interior aesthetic of Weisenborn, but I don't know, I've spent a lot of time trying to get it the same. And I think there's a certain beauty in the sort of machined surfaces um, that you see inside them. Cool. So should we open it up for, for yeah, any question? Yeah. How, how do we do this? I think um, people can just jump on the chat. Okay, folks, if you got questions, now's a good time. Do you see them on your screen there, Tony? Um, not as yet, but. Okay. I hope everybody's not too shy.
What uh, strings are you running on your Wasm one? I'm using those Asher Hawaiian strings, yeah. Hawaiian. So, yeah. And do you, you know, so, go ahead. And do you use the same on both the new one and the old one, or? I do. Yeah, I used to use light gauge strings, but I think I talked with you about it, and then we started. I think I tried using maybe medium gauge strings, but you know it works fine. So I do see a question here. It says mastery obviously comes at a cost. What has been the greatest cost to you to become such a master? That was a good, good question to tee up, tee up on. Yeah, T. Um, That's from Maddie Bell. Hmm. a great question i think it i think it comes at the cost of happiness it, um i think one of the things about being a perfectionist and and consistently trying to make things better is that you're just never really happy with what you do and so um as i've got older i think i've sort of like tried to just enjoy the small things of life in addition to being aware that like it's a life time progression. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, I'm guessing, you know, you were, you probably were really, really obsessed with, with this when you first got started. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're I'm sure you're still obsessed now, but in a, you know, you're, you know, you're a few years older than you were back then. Yeah. I mean, something like I used to run home from school to listen to my favorite Ben Harper recording, like, you know, just hear the sound of the guitar. And then I spent, you know, I started this business when I was 18, I'm 34 now. I spent all my early twenties just not going out and never spending time with my friends. I would always just be in my workshop building. And um, right. yeah, so yeah, I, I, still, I still love the guitar. Um, I've had a bit of a break from it recently, but yeah, no, I still, I still love the guitar. I love the, um, the sound that it makes, it still, it still feels the same. And uh, I love the people as well. I'm really grateful that you mentioned Boris before. Um, I think a lot sure. of people that I met early in my career have been they're, they're great people. They're, they've been really good to me. You were one of those people um, the whole way through. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I feel like the Wazenborn has looked after me as an instrument. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. cool. He's coming. So I'll, I'll read you the question here. So one other question is, uh, it's from Tom Serbo. He says, thank you for your time, Tony. How can you tell if, if your bridge is suffering from too much tension? And what, what should I look for with the bridge potentially pulling away from the top? This is why, mm -hmm. ironically, I sent back a pack of Asher strings in favor of an EJ42. That's a Diodario set of strings. So how can you tell if your bridge, your bridge is suffering from too much tension? What do you think? Okay, yes. So post-it notes. Everyone has post-it notes, right? Yeah. If you can get a piece of paper under the back corner or the wing of your bridge that's and it's coming loose, that means you've got too much tension. If it's holding on, then you're good to go. I would recommend for all Weizenborn guitars, Diario, Dario, uh, EJ17 for a 1927 or later. And an EJ16 for a 1927 or earlier, depending on the tuning. You know, like if, if you're an E or something like that, definitely a light gauge string. If you are in, uh, you know, D or something like that, a, a medium gauge string is absolutely fine. Um, I believe that, you know, different guitars sound different and I feel like they tell you if they're not happy with the amount of tension they've got on, got on them, they'll sound compressed and sort of thin-like um, when they're a bit overwhelmed. So yeah, lighten up or, check, or drop down a tuning half a step or whatever it is and uh, yeah, see how it is. Uh, there's another thing there. Um, 
they can look like they're pulling away from the top for 40 years and they're fine. You know, like, I don't think, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of Weizenborn guitars that have looked that way for a long time, but. Like Mike. <laughs> yeah, like, they've deformed to a certain point and there's environmental yeah. factors as well, you know, like don't keep them in the sun. Um, I feel like if they're stored in, in really high tension over time, that can account for a lot of it. I don't yeah. necessarily recommend detuning unless it's a really fragile early one. Yeah. So what, I mean, I, I've had the same experience as you have. I think we, we actually talked about this at one point in time. I was experimenting with some different tunings. And I think you said something like, well, in, in a way, the guitar will tell you what tuning it likes. I don't yeah. know if you use those. I don't want to quote you. I don't think that was the exact words that you used. But, you know, if, you, if there's too much tension, you can kind of tell yeah absolutely uh, yeah once you get used to what you're you know once you get used to it i suppose so i think there was another question there that was like hey uh what you know what strings do you recommend but i think what they're really trying to get at is gauge wise uh, uh speaking of speaking of string gauge what's an ideal for vintage wise born guitar yeah so what do you think about that so yeah, I use I use the Adario. There's no affiliation there. It's just what I like, and uh, I use an EJ17, which is a medium gauge set, or an EJ16, uh, which is a light gauge set. Sometimes I confuse those. So uh, that's that's what I use and recommend. The Asher strings are fine. Um, they're a bit heavy, I think, for vintage guitars, but lots of people use them. There's a there's a brand of string that uh, George No recommended called the New Tone Aloha, which is produced in the UK. And they're, they are a medium gauge string that um, come to tension with less tension. Um, so they're very popular. So in like 13, 13 on the, on the first string and like 56 on the... Yeah, so a medium, medium gauge set is 13 to 56 or 14 to 56, something like that. A heavy yeah, yeah, yeah. 58 to, you know, 14, 15, 16, something like that. Um, yeah, and I think also, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people change out the first string. So they change out the 13 for a 14 or something like that. It can give you a little bit more right. bite. Or you can take it back as well if it's, if it's too much. I feel like yeah. these guitars are inherently musical and um, they sing at a certain point. And that's why so many people have several of them is because they've got one guitar, each different guitar in a different tuning. Yeah, or different right. strings. So one question that I think is, it may be on the minds of oh, there's other people here, but I'll, I'll pose the question. Um, when I bought my first Weisenborn in 1988, I mean, I, I wasn't aware that there was anybody else building a contemporary Hawaiian guitar. Maybe there was. I certainly wasn't aware of it. But now, you know, if you look on the interwebs, there's no shortage of different builders building Hawaiian style guitars, many of which are calling them Weizenborn yeah. guitars. I know, I know you feel strongly that you don't want to call your guitars Weizenborn guitars yeah. out, of, out of respect for Herman Weizenborn, yet from everything that I've, and I've played lots of different contemporary guitars. For, for, to me, you're like the most, you build the most faithful reproduction of those guitars of anybody. I mean, nobody even comes close, but there are certainly some other good builders. And I, I'm, I know you know a lot of those guys and you're friends with those guys. Yeah, of course. But one of the questions that people probably have is like, well, you're looking at the interwebs and there's lots of fine looking guitars but how do you know if it's a really good guitar? And my, my thing is like, you have to get used to understanding and playing these guitars and understanding how they play, how they sound, what they're supposed to feel like. The feel of the guitar in your hands mm -hmm. is a huge deal for me. And I'm just, you know, like when you look at other guitars and play other guitars, I mean, how do you assess whether it's a well-built Hawaiian style guitar. What are the hallmarks of a really well built, you know, Weizenborn style guitar? Mm, yeah, I think I think musicality is is the number one criteria for me. Um, and just um, just a, like a mindful aesthetic, I suppose. You know, something that's um, 
that's built with the player in mind so that when they look down the fretboard that um, you know the strings look even to the player and that, that they're filed flat across the top so they don't buzz in the lower range you know just that sort of thing um, but it's hard it's hard to recommend guitars I I think I do what most people do and as I look to the players um, to see you know who's 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 what and who, who's building producing the, the good stuff you know sure. um, and 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 really look yeah, I feel like the the musicians who play the guitars are better qualified to answer that than me. But yeah, so yeah, um, a, a guitar that's inherently musical, and you know, nicely a nice setup from an aesthetic perspective. You know, perhaps aesthetic is the wrong word to use, but yeah, something that yep. feels nice. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, so Sid has a question. Do you have any plans for building building any other types of slide guitars in the future, like an Indian slide guitar, a Mohan Bina? Bina? Yes, I think I know who this is. Sid has a beautiful style for on order. Thank you, Sid. Um, yes, I do have plans to build other types of slide guitar. However, at this stage, it's not a Mohan Bina. Um, uh, there's been there's been some discussions going around for a while with various clients. Uh, uh, one client encouraged me and sort of set me free. He's like, "You've been doing these reproductions of Wiseman guitars for so long." He's like, "It's cool. It's cool that you're doing that, but definitely be free." Um, to, to do your own thing. And that was something I've always rejected. Um, I think in the early days, that was my point of difference was building something as faithful as possible. Uh, but in, in more recent times, I've come up with a few uh, ideas that I wanted to explore. But I mean, for me, it's really just, I have a long wait list for my guitars. So um, I need to uh, honor that and then at some point, I'm looking at doing some other designs as well, as well. Um, but I sort of I don't really want to talk about that too much. Um, I want to release the guitar as a as a product. Um, okay. Yeah. There's another one uh, that I can talk about though, uh, which is uh, the Nautilus. Uh, there's a, a wise and warm authority and uh, author called Ben Elder. Ben Elder sent me photos of a Nautilus Wazamon, which is a, and it popped up on our vintage Wazamon page recently. Uh, it's a, it's a star one with a resonator cone inside it. Uh, when I say resonator cone, it's a, it's like a Nautilus shell. It's a spiral of koa that's oh, wow. inside the guitar. And he sent me the photos of it for the purposes of a reproduction. So that's something I'm looking forward to doing uh, when I get the time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I have no idea how they sound. It's just a cool looking thing. Um, yeah. So there's at least two vintage Nautilus wise and ones. Yeah. Uh, you're very welcome, Sid. So I guess uh, one. I guess one question that that does pop up from time to time is is one of the to me one of the most amazing things about these guitars is they sound amazing just playing them acoustically. Mm. But when you plug them in, even with the sound hole pickup, the sound that they get, the depth of tone and the low frequencies is pretty amazing. And it's one thing for me to tell people about that. It's another thing for you to, you know, for you to go play a gig somewhere or somehow have the experience of playing through a, a good sounding room through a good sound system. It's like one of the most amazing experiences. I mean, it just sounds amazing. Yes. I don't think Herman Weisenborn could have ever imagined that that mm -hmm. guitar, that that guitar, which is relatively soft in tone compared to the later guitars, you know, think about, I think about Knudsen making his guitars first, Weisenborn right shortly after that, and then next thing you know comes resonating guitars, and that was, that sort of was the death knell of Weisenborn's because they were louder, and then you had lap steel, so there's this progression. Yeah. But it wasn't until so many years later, until you know Lindley came along, and then Ben Harper, and then some other players, 
who were playing these guitars with pickups and playing in you know, big places and you know blowing people's minds by how good they sounded. Were you surprised for the first time you played the guitar was why is it important? Was it playing it acoustically or was it plugging it in? Oh, acoustically. I didn't get uh, any amps or pedals too much later, but the first amp I got was a Demeter TGA2, which was amazing. It felt like you could pluck the notes out of the air. They were so thick and tangible. Um, and, and that's a whole beautiful art form in and of itself. But yeah, I, I love the sound of an overdriven Wisenborn. And that is why I build them as acoustically pure as I do is because I love that sound so much. Yeah, I've done a, I've done a bunch of work with that as well. Um, uh, with Thomas Oliver, Thomas um, yeah. loves or uh, loved this the sound of um, those artists that recontextualize the instrument, but also wanted to move it forward so that they were more equipped. They so that, yeah, like without the sort of like piezo sound, we wanted it to sound like a really loud version of what it did acoustically. So we we did a bit of work with that for. A couple of years there we were putting every single pickup in his guitar that was on the market um, and eventually he settled on a LR Bags anthem which is not really the done thing. Wisenborns are made with an uh, aluminum wire saddle and they don't really allow for a piezo type pickup um, and for right. many many years I absolutely refused to route the saddle for one but uh, I think Thomas, he, he ran out of places to go. So I sort of reluctantly was like, okay, we're going to do it. And uh, I, I cut the saddle on his, the guitar that I made, not the old one he had. Uh, and instead of using a bone saddle, like most people would use these days, I, I made it out of aluminum or aluminum. Uh, and it was sort of, it was a compromise. But I mean, I think a lot of people are, are really appreciative of his sound. Um, and yeah, I think he has he, he has moved it forward as well, which is cool, you know. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I'm uh, surprised to hear that. I would like to hear more about that. Uh, yeah. Vincent has a question. He says, I'm running a Sunrise pickup through my style four. Should I add padding or the pickup clamps to the sound hole? If so, what would you recommend? Uh, Vincent, the Sunrise is direct is designed to go directly onto your sound hole. And so depending on whether your style four is vintage or new, um, if it's vintage, the varnish will be so hard that it won't do any damage. Uh, if it's a new one and the lacquer is still out gassing, yeah, you'll get um, an indentation in the lacquer where the pickup goes. Uh, I would not put any padding underneath it it's not designed to take that uh the the maker of sunrise i forget his name i think it's jim uh jim you, yeah you can send him an email he's a nice guy you can ask him more about that but no i would just leave it as it is the sunrise is already perfect i've had this sunrise in yeah. my guitar for 30 years and it, it i don't think it's really made any marks on the guitar and believe me i haven't been super careful with it for whatever it's worth, but your your mileage may vary. Yeah. So um, did you put padding on that? Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. Uh, I, I never even thought of it. <laughs> uh, Tom Servo has a question. He says, I have a style one that he recently bought that has black, a black note, which is probably phenolic. And he wants to know if there's any way to tell if the material is phenolic material. And he said that uh, it might be ebony as, that, as the style of the guitar is very bright and not very 3D compared to style four. So is there any way to tell what that material might be and what are the sonic differences between phenolic and bone? Yeah, I think the phenolic, which is phenolic for those that don't know, phenolic is an early type of plastic. It might even be Bakelite or very similar to. No, it's different. It has a resin in it. Um, uh, phenolic, yeah, it's it's more it's more dull sounding. It's similar to ebony. Um, bone is brighter. Um, and 
also has a little bit of natural oil in it that um, helps lube the string as it goes through. Um, so I'm not so really sure what the question is in there. Um, I guess he's just wondering what the difference is between the two. If there's any way to know if, it, if which what it's made out of. I mean, you know, I mean, just hearing that, I mean, why not just put a bone nut in there and see how it sounds? It probably sounds yeah, a little sure. better. So the, he's talking about the department store guitars. Okay, so Weizenborn was a, a reasonably large manufacturer. He was able to supply demand from uh, music store dealerships and department stores of the day. Um, and so they, they show up under different names. Maui is one, um, Christopher's music store is another. Um, I'm sure there are others that I'm forgetting about, but um, often they're the most simple version of a Weizenborn. So they'll have a phenolic nut or um, maybe the edge of the fretboard won't be as beautifully rounded as it might be on one bearing his own name. Um, so yeah, I guess he was making a 30% cut or something to the department store. And so yeah, he cheapened them up a little bit, but um, I think I think they sound great. And if it's original, I would just leave it. I mean, unless it's easy to get off and loose, then maybe change it out. But I, I use phenolic on some of my guitars that are re reproductions of those ones. Uh, and yeah, I think they're cool. It's just a different, it's just a different thing. I would celebrate it as it is rather than trying to change it into something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we're, uh, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's just somebody, it's just Maddie saying we're, uh, letting you know, we're all enjoying the session. Thank you very much. Um, so you, I think, uh, Tony, any closing thoughts on your end? What do you, you know, anything that you want to, uh, words of wisdom, <laughs> anything you want to, <laughs> Share in closing. I think this is the first time we've done this, and uh, we certainly appreciate appreciate everyone coming. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to you, Rob, for setting this up. I know you've been after it for a while, and I'm appreciative to you for your long term support of my work. And uh, and yeah, um, George, No, Thomas Oliver, um, just uh, people who have helped and supported me along the way. Um, I'm great for the, the Monastra family and uh, the Drabble family as well. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any closing thoughts, just um, appreciation, I guess, yeah. Cool. I'll just, I'll just close by telling you guys that when I ordered my, uh, my guitar from Tony, uh, a guy named James Williamson, who played with Iggy Pop and the Stooges, I think he still does on occasion, sent me a private note uh, and said, you know, uh, you're going to love your guitar. He said, be prepared. It might take a little while to get it from Tony. It was, you know, he's not always going to be the speediest in getting you the guitar. He said, but however, he said, he told me, and I don't remember the exact words, but he said effectively that he felt that you built, that your quality and consistency was actually even better than Herman Weisenborn's. But the only difference was those are really old guitars and your guitars are new and you know but that will all come with time and when i got my guitar i have to admit that he that was a pretty accurate statement uh, you know i own a, I, I own your guitar that i got in 2011 so it's uh it's 10 years old the other guitar was built around 23 24 and the way that i view the two guitars is like you're looking at it's like two wines that are in different stages of aging you know the the vintage guitar is just drier wood it's been around for nearly a hundred years and it's a little mellower and your guitar is a little more lively because it's a newer, it's newer wood and it's still, you know, it's not, it's not at that aging stage yet, but they're both world-class guitars. And I, and I, I'm just, you know, that's the way I view it. Um, I think what James said is pretty accurate and the hard challenge, the challenge I think for you as a builder is, it's one thing to look at your guitars. It's another thing to play them for yourself. And when you get a chance to play them, you you not only know the difference, you'll feel the difference. So thank you, Tony, for taking the time to do this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Sound good? Great. Thank you, Rob. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.